So in this video, we'll look at the suborder Serpentis. Uh, this is snakes. Uh, we are very familiar with snakes. They are part of our dreams and nightmares. These are legless carnivorous reptiles. Uh, their skulls have more joints than the lizards have, so their skulls are very movable. You can see here, um, there's not a whole lot going on with that skull, and there's a lot of mobility. This allows them to capture prey much bigger than the skull itself, and uh, because the skull can distend and even some of the joints can separate temporarily without much problem, to the snake. Um, they have paired organs, but they're in sequence. And so instead of, think of, you know, normally like our kidneys are paired. We have a left kidney and a right kidney. They have two kidneys as well, but it's like the front kidney and the back kidney, which makes sense. It's kind of like all their organs are standing in a line down the length of the uh, snake. They only have one lung, however. They do not have paired lungs. There are around 3,600 species. They average in length from 4 inches to 30 feet. Most snakes are non-venomous, contrary to popular beliefs, but there are venomous species out there, and they are particularly dangerous to people. They are found in all the continents except for Antarctica, and there's Greenland again, once again being left out in the cold. And you can see here there are terrestrial snakes and there are some that live in the sea that are have adapted to the marine life. So a little bit about evolution of snakes. Here's a picture that is completely unhelpful because it's so blurry. Um, they have they descended from lizards and lost their legs. And so they kind of split off with from lizards early on and lost their legs. Some larger snakes in particular show these vestigial hind limbs in their anatomy. This isn't to say that they can like have little dead legs trailing along necessarily, but you can see that particularly in embryonic development. And it had to do with the changes in those Hox genes. If you remember Hox genes, they're like the, they are the blueprint genes that basically turn on and off. And these Hox genes changed, therefore the anatomy of the snake changed, and this, this proved to be a good change evolutionarily, and they have been very successful in that regard. They basically have evolved alongside mammals, which would make sense since the prey of most snakes are mammals. That isn't to say all snakes eat mammals, but a whole lot of them do. So a little bit about their senses. <laughs> Forgot all about that. Um, that's a former student of mine who was particularly afraid of snakes. And so, of course, I uh, didn't shy away from it, but made it worse for him. So that's, uh, we called it the Josh Ravel sense. And that was not a snake. That's not a sense that snakes actually have, but they do have quite a few. They some of them have infrared sensors called pits on the side of their faces, and that allows them to see heat signatures, which is um, you, know, you know helpful because since mammals uh, keep track or produce their own heat, and so they can see that and hunt them. Better. Some of them uh, track prey with their tongues, collecting particles from the air, as you see the one on the left there. This gives them a kind of a directional sense of taste and smell. If you can imagine being able to taste the wind um, and see which direction it's coming from, it could tell you where the prey is. Uh, the underside of snakes, very sensitive to vibrations, so they can feel things coming in the ground, or they can feel large prey or predator maybe approaching them. Um, their eyesight is going to vary from very keen, very good eyesight to almost blind, and eyesight is mainly used to track movements, and their eyes, some of them have eyes positioned in the front of the head. This gives them better depth perception and better ability to hunt. So a little bit about their skin. 
their skin is not slimy. If you've never handled a snake, they do not have slimy skin. Instead, they have very dry skin, and it's very smooth, very, uh, very smooth feeling, soft almost to the touch. Their belly scales, let's see if I have a picture here, I don't. Belly scales are used for climbing, so some snakes are able to climb. Uh, they have transparent eyelids to protect the eye. And uh, the outer layer of the skin is shed in one layer and in, in, all at once. And this is a good thing because it replaces the old skin. It removes parasites as well. So any ticks or other things that may be embedded in the skin are removed once that skin is shed. And some snakes can do this up to four times a year. So a little bit about their venom. Their venom are actually modified uh, saliva glands. And so this has to do with an evolutionary kind of change in which the, uh, to get complicated, the gene for the saliva gland actually copied itself and uh, those copies were changed and caused it to make venom in those glands. And you see this go away in some species and then come back in others. Uh, some use fangs to inject that venom and others are called rear fang snakes. So like these uh, snakes that we have around here, like cottonmouths and copperheads, and those things are front fanged. And so they actually inject with their teeth. But then the other snakes, we have one around here that's really uncommon, more found in the south called a coral snake. Um, that are rear fanged and they inject venom through channels in the back of their mouth in directly into the wound and those venoms can be i don't have that pictures here i don't uh, either hemotoxic which is toxic to the blood can cause real issues with wound and the wound kind of festers and it's not happy and can cause internal organ damage and then there's neurotoxins which can shut down the breathing which is the whole idea to kill the prey well for us it's it's not good and in some of those snakes actually have both a hematoxin and a neurotoxin in their venom for reproduction uh, internal fertilization oviparous some egg protection as you can see here in this picture uh, with some species but not often some species exhibit something called facultative parthenogenesis pa facultative parthenogenesis and what this is is uh, basically parthenogenesis means virgin birth and so uh, facultative means I mean kind of like if, if necessary it's a way of thinking about that and so the female species will actually the eggs the haploid eggs inside their bodies will become diploid and they will give birth to that without fertilization and so uh, almost like an asexual type reproduction. And this could happen in the, without mates in, in order to, uh, you know, make life go on a la Jurassic Park.